Welcome to the Lone Star Keto Podcast. I'm your host, Amber. My vision for this podcast is to showcase experts in the keto carnivore community, as well as those who have compelling stories that inspire and give others hope. My wish is that no one has to suffer like I did. If you find value in this podcast, please consider subscribing and hitting that notification button. And as always, feel free to share. Thank you so much for your support. Hi, I'm Amber and welcome to the Lone Star Keto Podcast. Today we have a special guest with us, Dr. Phil Ovadia, and he is a cardiac thoracic surgeon. So welcome, Phil. Oh, thank you, Amber. Great to be here. And thank you so much for having me on. Absolutely. So give us a little bit about your background. I want to know like your educational background and then go ahead and go into some of your your health journey. Sure thing. Uh, So, you know, I would say uh, I grew up pretty uh, uh, typical, uh, you know, kid Uh, grew up in New York and uh, um, went to school. ultimately in uh, Pennsylvania. I went to college and then medical school. And uh, then I did, uh, after medical school, I first did a uh, training program, a residency in what's called general surgery. uh, And I did that in New Jersey. And then I ended up in Boston to do uh, heart surgery training, cardiothoracic surgical training. And, uh, you know, uh, it, in, terms of my, uh, you know, sort of health background, I was always overweight, uh, you know, from for as long as I can remember. And uh, both my parents were overweight. Uh, and uh, I have a, a brother who's a type one diabetic, as well as, another, uh, as well as my sister. And, you know, we, we kind of followed all the guidelines gr- growing up. Uh, we were, you know, a, a low fat household. We had margarine instead of butter, and we only drank skim milk and diet sodas. And uh, we were also a very low sugar household because my brother was a, you know, type one diabetic, obviously. Uh, So, uh, you know, really, you know, when I think back, it was right in line with the, you know, with the guidelines. Uh, I was always uh, pretty active, played a number of sports, you know, in school, uh, rode my bike, you know, all that stuff. And uh, despite that, uh, you know, was always overweight. And then uh, throughout uh, college and medical school, uh, the, uh, you know, I just got heavier and heavier. Uh, I, I put on the typical freshman 15, I would say, and then, and then a sophomore 15 and a junior 15 and a senior 15. Uh, and, and medical school, honestly, is horrible for most people's health. You don't sleep, you don't eat right, uh, you know, long hours, uh, and that continues through uh, surgical training. So lo and behold, you know, uh, I would say there were a number of times during all that that I, you know, did try and lose weight or I did lose weight. uh, And I did the old, uh, you know, what I would what I learned in school, which was eat less, move more. Uh, I remember uh, particularly as I was finishing up my surgical training, I said, you know, oh, man, I really got to lose weight. Uh, and, uh, I, I went through about a six month period where, uh, I, you know, tracked everything I ate and every calorie and, you know, limited myself and, and was hitting the gym, you know, whenever I could. And, uh, and I did lose a bunch of weight and then I proceeded to gain it back. Like, like many others have, uh, and more, and I would went through that cycle a number of times and, uh, you know, I found myself 10 plus years into my career as a heart surgeon and, uh, you know, obviously spend all all my days taking care of people with heart disease uh, and diabetes and obesity. Uh, And I was, you know, very overweight. I was pre-diabetic and, uh, you know, but I just, I I had tried everything and, and nothing worked. And I just kind of, you know, threw my hands up and said, you know, I'm, I'm genetically destined to be overweight. Both my parents were overweight. It just it is how it is. And uh, fortuitously, uh, I went to a, uh, well, the first thing that happened was, uh, you know, my wife and I had had our kids at this point, And uh, my wife was really struggling with uh, heartburn after, after uh, the second pregnancy. And uh, it was suggested to her that she try going gluten free. 
And uh, she came home and talked to me about this. And I said, well, that sounds a little crazy. You know, you don't have celiac disease, uh, but you know, I'm a supportive husband. And I said, if you want to try it, I'll try it with you. And so we went gluten-free and this was probably about six years ago. So it was not quite, you know, the, all the gluten-free stuff wasn't available. And uh, inadvertently, you know, we basically went low carb. We stopped eating bread and pasta and we kind of went low carb. And I noticed right away, I, I actually felt a lot better. Uh, even before I started losing weight, I just noticed I had better energy and uh, felt better. And we did that for a little while. And then uh, a few months later, I was at a, uh, meet, a surgical uh, society meeting and Gary Taubes happened to be the invited guest speaker. Uh, so uh, that was my first exposure to low carb. I, uh, you know, I heard uh, Gary talk, I immediately read his books and it all just kind of made sense. And uh, immediately I went low carb and, uh, you know, over the uh, intervening uh, year or two, I lost, uh, you know, over 100 pounds uh, and, you know, really felt the best that I ever felt in my life. This is now going back, you know, four or five years. And I, I went through a pretty typical evolution, I would say, of, of you know, low carb and then keto. And then uh, I discovered carnivore uh, <laughs> about 18 months ago. Uh, and as almost everyone <laughs> It seems does. It was, uh, you know, hearing Sean Baker on, on uh, you know, the Joe Rogan podcast. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, at first I said, that sounds crazy. Uh, but, you know, I said, I started looking into it and started reading the literature and, and you know, listening to what Sean had to say and, and found Paul Saladino as well and uh, said, well, you know, I'll give it a try for 30 days. And, uh, uh, as good as I felt that I was doing on low carb keto, uh, carnivore was just, you know, truly amazing. Uh, you know, it, it just, uh, there were so many things that uh, improved, you know, and again, it, it's a lot of problems that I never really even realized I had uh, around inflammation, mm -hmm. especially. So the, the thing that was most obvious to me was uh, I had plantar fasciitis in my right foot for years that I could not get rid of. Uh, and, you know, I would, I would cut back my activities. I would stop running. I would, you know, do all the stretches, everything, nothing, you know, every morning I'd get out of bed. I'd, I'd put my foot down. It hurt, you know, for the first 15 minutes of the day. And, uh, you know, I just dealt with it. Uh, my third day on carnivore, I got out of bed. I put my foot down. It didn't hurt and it's never come back again. So it just that shows is you, so even though, interesting. Uh, even though I was exceedingly low car, you know, I would say in the few months leading up to carnivore, I was eating easily less than 10 grams of carbs a day. Uh, you know, just exceedingly low carb. What I would say was pretty clean keto. Uh, and uh, I still had that little bit of inflammation. And as soon as I went carnivore, it was gone and wow. uh, it's never come back again. So Wow. 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 That got me to where I am. And, and now I'm 18 months, uh, you know, into carnivore and, and uh, just never look back. That, that, that is so cool. Uh, I'm glad you brought up the plantar fasciitis. I had that and I'm going to tell you, I suffered with it for the longest time. And that was some of the most excruciating pain. I, I've given birth twice without any pain medication. And I thought that that fasciitis was the worst. I was like, you know what? Just chop off my feet and I'm just going to stay in a wheelchair because this is awful. So to think that it's possible that by going carnivore and getting rid of all the inflammatory foods and your body can heal, that's crazy. That is just crazy. And I hear a lot of stuff, you know, uh, success stories and that, that I'm kind of shocked actually with that. Yeah, you know, and, and that's one of the things about uh, carnivore and, 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 you know, being part of the Meet RX community and everything you, you know, you, you hear all these stories of all these, you know, medical conditions that get better or go away with carnivore. And, you know, you start to, 
as a physician, you start to, you know, almost question yourself, like, you know, do, does this really cure everything? <laughs> and we know it doesn't cure everything, but, uh, you know, at this point, you know, it's hard for me to think of uh, a condition that I wouldn't at least say, try it, you know, just, just give it a try, you know, and, and ultimately that's what I tell people, you know, try it for 30 days, you know, nothing's going to happen, you know, to you and nothing bad is going to happen with trying, you know, carnivore for 30 days and maybe it won't help, but, uh, most people, I, I think in the end it, it, it helps. I agree. And, and I give the same advice, especially if you've tried everything else and nothing works. What do you have to lose? What is 30 days of trying something, even if it's completely bizarre? It's not like you're taking in poison. You know, we're talking meat, which is, you know, as we know, is very nutrient dense, good food. So, exactly. yeah, that is crazy. Exactly. Okay, but so, so. Oh, go ahead. Finish up what you're saying. I, I was just going to say, you know, and, it, and in the end, what that really led me to conclude was that, you know, to realize how important metabolic health was to all the conditions that, mm -hmm. you know, really affect people these days. And, and uh, you know, so my ultimately my message to everyone is, you know, focus on improving your metabolic health uh, and the rest will follow. I could not agree more. That that's great advice. Okay, so let's let's get a little personal here. I want to know why did you decide to become a doctor? And specifically, why did you go into the field you did? Why did you want to be a cardiothoracic surgeon? Yeah, so, you know, uh what led me to becoming a doctor is uh you know, I, I I don't ultimately have a great answer to that because it's just something I've always known I wanted to do. When you ask my okay. parents, they will tell me at three years old, when people asked me what I wanted to do, I always said I wanted to be a doctor. And I don't really even know if I truly knew what a doctor was at that point. But, um, you know, I think it probably had something to do with my brother, as I mentioned, being a type one diabetic and, you know, seeing him, you know, kind of uh, you know, he got sick when I was pretty young. Uh, and, uh, you know, so that that probably influenced me. Uh, and uh, so I always knew I wanted to be a doctor. And I always actually knew I wanted to be a surgeon of some sort. Uh, you know, I, I just enjoy the, uh, you know, kind of the technical aspects of that. I enjoy being hands on, you know, with with people. Uh, and then, uh, you know, ultimately, as I went through medical school and, and training, uh, heart surgery, heart and lung surgery, cardiothoracic surgery, you know, was the most attractive to me just because it really, um, you know, the heart, the heart is truly what keeps us going, you know, it's what keeps us alive. Uh, and uh, I just find I found the the way that the heart works. Uh, fascinating, uh, you know, the, the mechanics, the physiology of it, uh, and uh, just the, the, the surgery itself, uh, you know, it's a very kind of detailed, obviously, technically involved surgery. Uh, so it, it just was the most, you know, sort of attractive special to me, specialty to me as I went through uh, all my training. Very interesting. So, you spoke about both your parents being overweight and I read that, did they both have a weight loss surgery? Yeah, my, both my parents uh, had gastric bypass surgery, uh, you know, while I was uh, uh, in medical school and uh, that, that was, you know, at my urging at that time, because I thought it was the best option uh, for losing weight. Uh, you know, I kind of wish I knew now what I, you know, I, I knew mm -hmm. then what I know now, uh, but uh, that they, they both had it. They've both done exceedingly well with it. Uh, you know, this is now going back, uh, you know, over 15 years for both of them. And they've, they've done well with it. Uh, okay. But, you know, as I said, we uh, now, uh, I would certainly have different advice for them. So you said they're doing well. So have they been able to maintain their weight loss? Yes, they, they both ha 
they both have. Uh, wow. Although that is not not typical. No, uh, it's as, not. <laughs> as you probably know many people who have uh, do. weight loss surgery ultimately end up gaining back the weight. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that has to do with the number of factors and, and, you know, what type of surgery you have and, 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 uh, your behaviors afterwards. But again, you know, I think ultimately for a lot of people, uh, weight loss surgery does not address the underlying issue that led to them yes. becoming overweight in the first place. And, uh, and, you know, the, both the physiologic, you know, sort of food dependence issues, which I think play a large part in it, uh, as well as, you know, for a lot of people, there were, you know, perhaps some psychologic aspects as well to becoming overweight. Uh, but, uh, you know, most importantly, it doesn't directly address the, the whole metabolic health issue. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it does inadvertently sort of lead to improvements because you're so restricting your food intake uh, but I don't think it's the best way to really address uh, underlying metabolic health problems. That's exactly right. But I'm super glad that that your parents have been able to maintain their loss. Like like you said, I know a lot of people who have had the surgery. I do, and I only know one that's kept it off. One, one out of all the people. And I know like, I don't know, 20 something people I know. And, and not just, I saw them on the internet, you know, no, these are people I personally know. So it, it's, it's so yay, kudos to them because that is not typical, but okay. Yeah. So you've been in practice a while, obviously before you ever even went keto or anything like that. And as I think we probably all, all know by now that physicians don't really get much education on nutrition in med school. Talk a little bit about what education you got as far as nutrition went. And did you ever talk nutrition with your, your patients prior to knowing what you now know? Yeah. So, you know, in terms of what I actually learned in medical school uh, and throughout my training for nutrition, uh, you know, it, it was extremely limited. Uh, you know, I believe we had a uh, it was about a six hour course uh, during the first year of medical school uh, that, you know, covered nutrition. But thinking back, it really didn't even cover nutrition. You know, it kind of covered what a carbohydrate is and what, a you know, how our body, you know, deals with, uh, you know, fatty acids and fats and, and uh, you know, it's sort of the mechanics of nutrition, but I don't think it really, uh, it, you know, covered what I think of, uh, you know, nutrition now. And it certainly did not um, discuss the impact of what we eat on our health. Uh, and as I went through my, you know, my career, my early part of my career, uh, you know, my discussions with patients regarding nutrition were, were very much the, you know, the food guidelines and the, the standard American Heart Association recommendations of, you know, low fat, low salt. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, because that, that's what I knew and that's what I had heard. And uh, that messaging is, is, you know, very pervasive in medicine. I, I don't think people realize how you know, how much of an influence uh, that has in medicine, you know, it, it dictates the food that's served to patients when you're in the hospital. Uh, it is, um, you know, it, it's kind of part of the standard post-operative recommendations that get given to patients to go home, uh, you know, and then, uh, you know, if they're diabetic on top of it, they get the American Diabetes Association recommendations. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, none of those serve patients well. Uh, and ultimately, I don't think any of those guidelines uh, help to make people better. And I think they actually, unfortunately, make people worse. Yeah, that, so, that I, I've had the opportunity to talk to quite a few doctors. And they talk about how, because they didn't know any different, and they went by the guidelines, that's what you're told. And that's kind of what you're required to, you know, talk about with your patients anyway. But now knowing what they now know with, with all the, you know, information coming out, they look back and it horrifies them 
of the advice that they gave their patients. Do you have any of, of that? Like, I, I don't, I don't know if guilt's the right word, but you know, thinking back going, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, you know, as I mentioned, you know, it, it, it's, you know, it, I have those feelings about, you know, the patients that I, you know, counseled, uh, you know, in what I now know is a wrong way. As I mentioned, you know, uh, my parents, uh, you know, uh, and my family, uh, and, and just me personally, you know, I personally suffered by following those recommendations. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was only through, as I think, you know, many of the physicians who have ended up in the low carb space, uh, when you talk to them, uh, almost to a T, they all have the same story. You know, it was only when they were seeking to improve their own health, uh, and, and got outside, you know, the normal sort of, uh, bubble of information, uh, that, that, uh, you know, we discover uh, things like low carb and carnivore and, and keto. And, uh, and then we just see that they work. Uh, and, you know, what's even more upsetting to me is that I then started, you know, going through the literature and saying, you know, why, why didn't I, you know, how did no one know this before? You know, how did it take Gary Tobbs, you know, a non-physician mm -hmm. uh, to discover this or, or, you know, people like Nina Teichels or, you know, all of these people who did, you know, who really have, you know, brought the message to the forefront. Uh, but then you go back and you see scientific studies dating back 50 years, 100 years, you know, that talk about all of this. And, you know, the yeah. reality is, is we did know it and we forgot it, or we, it was intentionally suppressed, depending on how you look at things. Yeah, uh, I'm going to go with that. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I tend to go with that as well these days, because uh, when you do look back at the history of it all, uh, it's hard to think that it wasn't intentional, uh, but it got buried and it got lost. And, you know, literally millions and millions of people have suffered because of it. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that, that is what ultimately is most upsetting uh, to me. Yeah, I, and I, that would be hard for me. Uh, now, you still have to go by the standard of care, right? You still have like certain guidelines because you're, it's not like me. I can say stuff, but I don't have a, you know, a board to answer to, but you do. So how do you circumnavigate that? How, how do you, you know, try to give good advice to your patients without overstepping that boundary? Well, you know, so I, I, I have become more uh, confident, you know, having gone through all the literature now and having, you know, researched all of this extensively as I have, and being able to see, you know, the experience from the community, you know, as a whole, the Meet RX community and every, you know, all the other kind of low carb communities out there uh, has given me more, uh, you know, more confidence uh, to uh, go through this because, you know, the reality is, is that um, there are sort of these standards and guidelines, uh, but as long as a doctor is doing what they feel is reasonable, they really, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, can't get in, uh, in trouble. Uh, you know, uh, okay, the doctors that doctors that get in trouble are usually doing things recklessly. Um, and I think it, you know, I, I'm confident that if I had to defend myself, uh, at this point, I would be able to say that, you know, what I did was what I do, do is reasonable. And, you know, there's plenty of literature and experience to support that. Uh, you know, unfortunately, as you know, there have been a couple of physicians that have had to actually go through trials. Yeah. Uh, you know, that Tim Noakes and Gary Fecky, uh, yeah. you know, ha have both uh, had to go through the ringer, uh, but both ultimately were exonerated. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think there's enough, uh, there, there's enough scientific literature to stand upon 
and there's enough experience to stand upon at this point that uh, I'm not worried about it. Um, you know, from a from a you know kind of licensing uh, standpoint. Uh, but you know, it still does take some some uh, I guess some bravery to to still be going against you know the norm. Oh uh, gosh, certainly yes. I go against <laughs> the norm. And you know, when I have the discussions with patients these days, I do kind of frame it that way. I say, listen, this is what the standard advice is. You know, so most of the patients I'm dealing with, obviously, as a cardiac surgeon, you know, they have, they already have heart disease. And I'm either talking to them right before we're going to do surgery or I'm talking to them after, you know, we've already done surgery. And I say, listen, you know, these are the recommendations. You've heard them before and look at where they've gotten you. And then I start to tell them, you know, this has been my experience. Uh, you know, this is something that has helped me personally. This is something that I've seen help a lot of other people. And uh, if you're willing to consider it, you know, I, I, you know, I, I try and kind of coach them along through that. Uh, the, the unfortunate thing, you know, for me as a heart surgeon is, is that I, I do have sort of limited contact. You know, I, I see mm. the patient before the surgery, I operate on them. I see them for a few weeks after the surgery. Uh, but then they're going to go back to their primary care physician or their right. cardiologist for the most part. And usually, you know, if, if they've listened to my message and they say, you know, and they kind of, you know, have, uh, you know, faith in what I say, uh, they're going to get pushback oftentimes from their other physicians. And, and that's what becomes, you know, most difficult. Yeah, for sure. I hear this a lot from various doctors. So yeah, that's not surprising at all. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about cholesterol. Since you are sure. technically a heart doctor, and that seems to be like the number one scary thing for people is, oh my goodness, my cholesterol is high. What am I going to do? I need to be put on a statin. And that's pretty much the standard of care. What is your take on cholesterol? Like, when does it become an issue? When would you worry about it? I know you see patients kind of like after the fact or whatever, but what would your advice be if somebody came to you and their cholesterol was high? Yeah. So, you know, my overall message to people, uh, regarding cholesterol is, you know, uh, cholesterol is, part of the process that ultimately leads to heart disease. Uh, but it's not what starts the process. Uh, and what starts the process is poor metabolic health and metabolic disease and insulin resistance, you know, however you want to call it. Uh, so, you know, what I tell people ultimately is we can treat your cholesterol, at least part of it, you know, with a statin drug, we can treat the LDL, which is only one type of cholesterol, but that's not treating the underlying problem. And ultimately the data goes along with that because if cholesterol was truly the causative, you know, the, the number, the thing that caused heart disease in and of itself, uh, then I would not end up operating on the number of people that I do that have normal or low cholesterol. LDL cholesterols. Uh, and the reality is, is that, you know, uh, you know, if you look at the statistics from, if you look at people who come for cardiac surgery, uh, probably half of them have an LDL cholesterol that is under the recommendation of 100 and, you know, 100 or 120, depending on which guidelines you're looking at. A lot of those people it's because they're already on statins, but a, a fair number of them are not on statins and they have a normal cholesterol level and they're still on my table getting heart surgery. So, uh, you know, that, that really makes you question, you know, the narrative about cholesterol causing heart disease. And what I now tell people is cholesterol doesn't cause heart disease. It plays a part in the process, but the key is, get your metabolic health straight. If you're trying to prevent heart disease or you have heart disease and you're trying to prevent it from getting worse, uh, I tell people to focus on your metabolic health uh, and don't worry about the LDL cholesterol number. 
Now, what is important to me for cholesterol numbers are actually the other types of cholesterol that you know people will get on a standard cholesterol panel. Uh, so the triglycerides and the HDL uh, are, are more important numbers to me. And you want your triglycerides to be low and you want your HDL to be high. Uh, and that is just a reflection of being metabolically healthy. Uh, so if your triglycerides are low and your HDL are high, uh, I don't care what your LDL cholesterol is. Uh, and, uh, again, you know, personally, I am walking around with a very high LDL cholesterol. Last time I checked it, it was over 300. Uh, but my triglycerides are low. My HDL is high. I even went the extra step of having a coronary artery calcium scan to look directly whether I have any blockages in my arteries. And despite my LDL cholesterol of over 300, uh, I have a, a CAC score of zero. Wow. So again, that tells you that, uh, you know, there, there's something more than LDL cholesterol that, that's playing a part in the process. Um, and so, you know, in general, uh, you know, I, I I usually discourage people from taking statins in most situations. I think the only situation it really makes sense to take a statin drug is if you have heart disease and you have a high cholesterol, a high LDL cholesterol, and you're not willing to do what it takes to improve your metabolic health, then yes, you probably should take a statin and there probably is a small benefit to doing so. Uh, with some, you know, long-term side effects that are concerning to me. But uh, if, if you're not willing to address the underlying problem of, of poor metabolic health, uh, then, you know, probably taking a statin is better than not taking a statin in that situation. But like I said, in the end, every, I think everyone can get more bang for their buck improving their metabolic health than taking the statin drug. I would have to agree with you there based on all the research I've done myself. Okay. So when you're talking about cholesterol and you, you mentioned the HDL and the, the triglycerides, and there's usually like that ratio. Talk a little bit about that so people can understand. For instance, um, I had a trigs of 74 and my HDL was 98. It doesn't get any better than that, I'll tell you. But uh, so uh, go carnivore. Is, yeah, exactly. This is very, uh, you know, this is a, a little bit nuanced. So it's important for people to understand this because when you get your cholesterol panel and you go see, you know, your doctor for the most part, they're they're not going to talk about this. And there are a couple of ratios that, depending on where you get your lab work done, will get reported but none of those are the ratio that you should be most interested in. Uh, so as you mentioned, you should take your triglycerides and you should divide it by your HDL. Uh, and if it's under two, you're doing pretty good. Uh, anything under 1.5, I would say is very good. Uh, and if it's under one, you're, you know, you're knocking it out of the park metabolically. <laughs> uh, so, um, and, and if, if your triglyceride to HDL ratio is under two, uh, the data actually shows that the higher your LDL cholesterol is, the longer you're more likely to live. And again, that's, that's data that's in the scientific literature, but most physicians don't know about it and don't pay attention to it. Uh, and the sad reality is, is that, you know, a large majority of the people walking around do not have a triglyceride to HDL ratio that's under two, uh, and they are not metabolically healthy. So, you know, their high LDL is a concern. Um, you know, again, I don't think statins are the right approach to that, but, uh, you know, I will admit that a high LDL, if you're not metabolically healthy, it is a concern and it does play a part in the process of developing heart disease. Okay, let's let's back up just a little bit, just for, for maybe somebody who is not in our community, who is not up on metabolic health. Just briefly explain what is metabolic health 
And sure. what are some indicators of not good metabolic health? Yeah. So, you know, the simplest way I like to explain metabolic health is, uh, you know, metabolic health reflects how your body processes the food that you're eating. And when it's doing that properly, it, your body is able to burn, you know, use the energy uh, cause you know, basically all food is, is energy, uh, and, and building blocks. So protein are the building blocks for our body and then fat and carbohydrates are the energy source for our body. And a metabolically healthy person is able to correctly utilize whatever inputs it's be, you know, whatever you're eating gets, gets partitioned properly by your body. Uh, unfortunately, when you become you know, metabolically unhealthy, uh, your body no longer does that correctly. So a lot of what you eat, a lot of the energy that you eat ends up getting stored as fat. Uh, although, you know, I always caution people to remember that you don't need to be obese to be metabolically unhealthy. Uh, so, you know, how do we measure it? There are a couple of ways. The simplest way, the simplest at-home test that anyone can do is the ratio of your waist to your height. Uh, so you don't even need a tape measure for this. You take a piece of string, you wrap it around your waist twice, uh, about an inch above your belly button, and then you hold it up to your head. And if it, dra if it reaches the floor and drags on the floor, that means that you're metabolically, you're very highly likely to be metabolically unhealthy. So you want your waist to be half of your height is basically what you're trying to do. If you do have a tape measure and you wanna measure it exactly. Uh, so number one is waist to height ratio. Uh, beyond that, you know, the best thing we can then do is some blood work. And uh, one thing I already mentioned is the triglyceride to HDL ratio. Uh, if that's under two, uh, you're probably okay. Uh, and if it's under 1.5, you know, you're metabolically healthy. Uh, and then the other blood test that I recommend that everyone get, uh, and again, this is something you have to specifically ask for because most physicians don't get it as part of your routine blood work is an insulin level, a fasted insulin level. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it's a cheap blood test. It can be easily done. It just is not part of the standard panel that doctors get. Uh, and then the other problem is even when doctors do get it, uh, they don't necessarily interpret it correctly. Because uh, to be metabolically healthy, you want your fasting insulin level to be less than 10. You want it to be single digits. Most laboratories, uh, you know, when you go and get your lab done and you look at that sort of normal value, uh, it's going to be up to 20 or 30. Uh, but, uh, you know, I would, I would tell most people that if your fasting insulin is, is 20, uh, you know, you're, you're in trouble. You're not metabolically healthy. So, you know, those, those are kind of the easy things that I tell people to focus on. Uh, you know, you can certainly do deeper dives and you can start measuring things like your, you know, your visceral fat levels, uh, or, uh, you know, doing a, a, a craft test, which is measuring your insulin response, uh, to eating, uh, you know, to eating sugar. Uh, but for most people, you really don't need to go that far. Uh, and the sad reality is, is that, uh, you know, when you look at, uh, you know, kind of those basics of metabolic health, most people fail. Uh, the, you know, the data that came out, uh, you know, most recently shows that 88% of the adults in the United States are not metabolically healthy. So, uh, you know, I, I, I start with the basics and then if people want to go, you know, get more detailed, uh, you know, that's when I encourage them to, to seek out a physician who's, uh, you know, knowledgeable and experienced in this uh, to help them, you know, help guide them through that. Okay, for again, somebody who is not in our community and has done the research, what are some d diseases that have the underlying issue of being a metabolic issue? List some things, because I don't think people really connect that or understand this. 
Yeah. And to be honest, you know, I don't think most physicians understand or connect this, but the reality is when you look at heart disease, uh, when you look at uh, diabetes, when you look at strokes, uh, and when you look at cancer, uh, the vast majority of those all have their roots in, uh, you know, metabolic health or, or lack of metabolic health. Uh, and uh, so that, you know, those four are, uh, you know, certainly you're talking about, you know, 90% of what kills people in this country, uh, you know, roughly. Uh, other things that I think are related to metabolic health are a lot of the autoimmune conditions, uh, you know, a lot of the inflammatory bowel conditions that people suffer from, uh, you know, and things like uh, Crohn's disease or, um, you know, just, just, celiac disease or being gluten intolerant, uh, I think is largely a uh, metabolic health problem. I think a lot of the hormonal uh, issues that both men and women have, uh, you know, low testosterone, low estrogen, uh, you know, thyroid issues, uh, a large portion of that is, is related to metabolic health as well. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it almost becomes a, uh, it almost becomes an easier question to ask what conditions are not related to metabolic right. health. <laughs> and, and the reality is, is I think few of the chronic medical conditions that affect people these days are not related to metabolic health. You know, yep. I think there are, some, I would agree. you know, it, it, it's, it's hard. It's hard at this point for me to find the ones that aren't uh, at least uh, partially related to metabolic health. Uh, so again, I think if we all just focused on improving our metabolic health, most of the other issues would, you know, get better just by doing that. Okay, though. But how does one gain metabolic health? What is some advice you would give somebody to get their health in check? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, there are basically four pillars of uh, metabolic health. Uh, I think diet is absolutely the most important pillar. Uh, and then I think exercise, sleep, and, uh, you know, kind of uh, other lifestyle, you know, would be the other three. Uh, getting out in the sun is, is the biggest one I, I point people to. Uh, so those, those are the four things I always say, you know, uh, but diet, it, it, you know, diet is absolute number one by a long shot. I think if you fix your diet, and even if you don't do anything about the other three, uh, you're going to vastly improve your metabolic health. And when we look at the diet, I think, um, you know, the, the absolutes that I, I would say most people who think about this can agree upon are you have to eliminate processed carbohydrates. You should eliminate um, the processed oils, uh, the fake, you know, seed oils, vegetable oils. Uh, you know, and, and the processed oils. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I, I think when you're trying to improve your metabolic health, you probably need to limit your carbohydrate intake. Uh, ultimately, I think if you achieve metabolic health or you're already metabolically healthy, uh, you know, eating some, some amount of clean carbohydrates, non-processed carbohydrates is probably fine. Uh, but when you're trying to improve, if you're already metabolically unhealthy, I think as much as you can eliminate carbohydrates, you know, will help you to get uh, metabolically healthy. I could not agree more. Okay. So, you know, I, basically I tell people eat real food and you'll get metabolically healthy. Oh, uh, a lot you know. better off. Do you believe that yeah. there is a one size fits all diet? No, I don't think it's one size fit all. Uh, but I think within that framework, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, I think if you just eat real food, uh, you know, I think there's probably some discussion depending on your situation about, you know, how much should be animal based, how much should be plant based. Uh, you know, personally, I think mostly animal based is probably better for most people. Uh, but I think there is some wiggle room there. And I, again, I think it depends on, you know, the kind of specific background that you're coming from, the specific conditions that you're trying to overcome. 
and, and whether you're starting from, you know, good metabolic health or not, uh, I, I think makes a difference. Uh, so, you know, I, ultimately I tell most people that I think a, a mostly carnivore diet, um, is, uh, you know, probably a good, a good base to build upon. And, uh, you know, once you get metabolically healthy, you know, maybe you can have, you know, maybe you can add back some things, uh, you know, some of the non-processed foods. Uh, but the reality, what, you know, I think is most important for people to understand and it is what is hardest for people to understand is that those things are not necessary. I think, uh, you know, you and I and the tens of thousands of people in the carnivore community have certainly proven to this point that it is possible to live on a truly carnivore only, uh, you know, diet, uh, and we're all thriving and doing well. So, you know, it, you, you have to then ask yourself, you know, why do I want to add back these other things? And I think for most people, uh, you know, myself included, I really don't have a good reason for adding back those things. <laughs> so I haven't added them back. Uh, you know, can you? Yes. But, you know, why? I, I, enjoy, I enjoy eating, you know, carnivore. I enjoy eating meat. Uh, I really don't miss or have cravings for, you know, broccoli or kale or any of that stuff. Uh, and, uh, you know, do I occasionally have some non-carnivore things? Yes. You know, I'll have some dark chocolate here and there. Uh, I'll even have a big potato now and again. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, for the most part, uh, like I said, we, you know, day to day, I'm perfectly happy eating meat, seafood, you know, eggs and, and some cheese and uh, keeps me very happy, it keeps me very satisfied, and it keeps me feeling, you know, a as good as I can feel. But Phil, it's so restricting. Don't you uh, know that... it's restricting? How is it sustainable? Yeah, well, here I am 18 months <laughs> later, and uh, somehow, somehow I've made it through. Um, you know, I, I think again, that, that just gets back to, you know, the mindset and, uh, you know, people who aren't carnivore, uh, until they try it, I, I, it is, you know, and again, like I said, when I, when I first heard Sean talk about, you know, carnivore, I, I admit it sounded crazy, <laughs> uh, but then do you try it? And, uh, you know, most of the people I know that have tried it don't go back. Uh, because they get great results from it and they are happy and they are satisfied and they, mm -hmm. you know, they find the food fulfilling. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of funny when you ask, uh, you know, most people, you know, if there's one food, you know, that you can eat uh, without worrying about health or anything, you know, just like if you're on the desert island and you only get one food, the two most common answers I hear are steak and bacon. So, <laughs> and then so when I tell them guess what you can eat just steak and bacon uh you know they were like really and then I said try it you know and, and they do and they're happy and you know it ultimately it gets them to better health it doesn't get much better than that and you know no, what, it, like, like what you're talking about uh, once you feel good and and you, you are metabolically healthy do you kind of are like, why would I go back to doing that other stuff, eating that other stuff that is going to hurt me? For me, I mean, I, I got rid of a lot of my conditions, the issues that I had going keto. But the one thing that I didn't even really understand I had an issue with was digestive problems. I just accepted that that was normal. Um, because it, when I went keto, it got so much better. But when I went carnivore, I was like, Oh my God, there was no bloating, no gas, no pain, no uh, constipation. None of that. It was all, it was gone. It was just gone. And that reason alone makes me go, I don't really care to eat fiber ever again in the form of vegetables or, you know, I've been without grain for a very long time and don't care about it, but the vegetables I loved, I was almost vegetarian at one point because I love not vegan vegetarian because I love vegetables, but now I look at them as these little things that cause me a great deal of pain and I don't really care anymore, you know? <laughs> 
Yeah. And, you know, that that's one of the other things I always try and tell people is that, you know, one of the one of the unfortunate things that has happened to us as a society is we don't realize what we should actually feel like. We accept Mm -hmm. not feeling well. Uh, And whether it's digestive Mm -hmm. or just, you know, being sluggish and low energy or, you know, everyone says, oh, it's normal that, you know, I'm 40 years old and my joints hurt when I get out of bed. And, you know, it's just the normal aging process. And then, you know, by the time I'm 50 and I'm on three medications, you say that's normal. And you look around and everyone else is. So you say, okay, it's normal. But the reality is it's not normal. Uh, and we truly have lost sight of what healthy and normal is. Uh, and, and that's, you know, I think, you know, a, a big problem for us. Uh, so, um, you know, I try and tell people again, you know, try it for 30 days, see what you feel like. Um, and we know that there's a transition period and initially, you know, some people feel lousy and, and, you know, I try and coach them through that because, you know, having gone through it and, and, you know, coached many people through it. Now we know some of the tricks and, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. tips to avoid uh, going through a lot of that stuff. Uh, But, you know, ultimately, like I said, you know, what I try to stress to them is see how good you actually feel, you know, 30, 60 days in uh, and you won't want to go back. I I, I agree with you there. And, you know, the reason I started keto to begin with was to lose weight, right? It wasn't about being metabolically healthy because quite frankly, at that point, I didn't care. I wanted to look good. I wanted to fit my size zero jeans. And so that was my whole focus. But after coming out on the other side and I understand what true health feels like, like what you were just saying. Most of us have no clue. We just accept it as being normal. And we're heck half the time we're told that's normal. Oh yeah, of course, gas is, is completely normal. You know, do a Rudy to to 500 times a day. That's normal, you know, but when you have that health, it's like, oh, that's what it's like. And then that whole aesthetic thing kind of, pales in comparison to how healthy you feel. Yeah, I think that's, that, you know, says it well, and that's exactly it. And that, that's what led me ultimately to, uh, you know, start my uh, telemedicine practice, which is focused on metabolic health and helping people uh, to do this. Uh, So, uh, you know, that, that, you know, what you hear from a lot of physicians who have gone through this same uh, kind of, you know, transition and, and have had their eyes open to, uh, you know, the whole kind of low carb keto carnivore is, you know, you can't unsee it once you see it. And <laughs> I certainly can't unsee it. Uh, so I love being a cardiac surgeon. Uh, I still do that uh, actively, uh, but I've become very passionate about helping people regain their metabolic health. And uh, so I've started a uh, telemedicine practice, uh, Obadia Heart Health, uh, in which, uh, you know, I I help people do exactly that, you know, regain your metabolic health. Uh, You know, obviously, a a lot of people come to me because of my background with with cardiac issues, with heart issues. So I do get a lot of clients who, you know, have heart and cardiac issues that they want to focus on. Uh, but you know, ultimately, I, like I said, I, I kind of steer them towards if we fix your metabolic health, the heart issues will improve. Uh, and, uh, or, you know, if you're trying to prevent heart disease, the best way to do so is by focusing on your metabolic health. Absolutely. Okay. So we're getting close to time and are you up to talk about a controversial subject? I love controversial subjects. Okay. I had a feeling you're going to be game for this, but, but this is such a huge thing. That's all you see on social media right now. It's between, you know, the election and mask and COVID, whatever. Yeah. You, you are a surgeon, you wear masks. There's a reason for wearing masks. As a doctor, a surgeon, I want you to talk a little bit about mask and how they help or may not help 
as far as this virus situation is going? What is your take, your opinion? Okay, we're just going to call yep. it your opinion. So uh, my opinion, uh, but again, this is based on, you know, I, I, I looked at this issue the same way I looked at nutrition ultimately, and I, I've gone through and I've read the literature and I stay up to date on the studies. And I think in the end, uh, you know, what you can say is uh, the first thing I would say is that the data is absolutely clear that being metabolically unhealthy makes you more susceptible to COVID. Uh, and if you get exposed to COVID, ultimately, being metabolically unhealthy puts you at higher risk for, you know, complications, being in the hospital and ultimately dying. Uh, and and that, that should not be controversial at all, because uh, it's very clear from the data. Uh, so, you know, again, uh, similar to what we talked about with the statins, um, you know, masks might help some with reducing your exposure to the virus. Uh, but ultimately, my advice to people is if you focus on your metabolic health, it's going to go a lot longer uh, way to protecting you against the virus than wearing a mask is. I think, you know, when you look at the data on masks, <clears throat> there was just a uh, large, uh, what we call a meta-analysis. Uh, it, it came from a group, they're called the Cochrane uh, Organization, the Cochrane Library, and they truly are the gold standard in terms of, you know, they look at a topic, they go through all the medical literature, uh, all the studies, and they look at two things. They look at, you know, first of all, you know, does a study show the effect that you're looking for. So in this case, you know, do masks help prevent people from getting sick from respiratory illnesses? Uh, and then they also look at the quality of the evidence, uh, you know, the quality of the data behind that. So they just, you know, within the past three weeks, released their review on uh, whether they called it non-pharmaceutical interventions. Uh, so, you know, masks, washing hands, they looked at a bunch of different things, but specifically on masks, they looked at whether wearing a mask helped reduce the spread of respiratory viral illnesses. Now, again, we don't have data specific to COVID yet uh, because, it, you know, those studies just haven't been done with one exception. Uh, but basically, the outcome of the review was that masks do not it, it was low quality evidence, first of all, uh, and that evidence that we do have did not suggest that there was any benefit to uh, masks in reducing the spread, uh, you know, through the general population of a respiratory viral illness. So, you know, what I ultimately tell people is if you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. I'm not here to tell anyone that you shouldn't wear a mask. Um, I don't think it is like... I don't think that uh, there should be mandatory mask, man, you know, uh, th that we should have mask mandates though, because the science just does not support that uh, as being useful. And I would have much rather seen our messaging and our efforts be put towards telling people to improve their metabolic health Yes. <laughs> telling people to wear a mask. Yes. And that is not so. the conversation. But would people really do it? People don't want to do things like that. They want an easy fix. They want a pill, a pill, you know, medicine, something, a, a mask, whatever. So they don't have to deal with what the real issue is. Well, and again, I think if they understood it correctly, you know, a lot of people would, you know, uh, you know, I think the problem is, you know, there's always been this message of it's so hard to do it. And, you know, all the diets fail because most mm -hmm. of them do. Uh, so, you know, uh, but when you really sit down and explain to people and say, listen, it's not even about losing weight. You know, we can show measurable improvements in metabolic health within 30 days uh, if you just lower your mm -hmm. carbohydrates, forget about, you know, going carnivore or anything, you know, there are studies where they just do what you and I would not even consider low carbohydrate, you know, <laughs> under a hundred grams, 
you know, it is low, you know, realize that the average American eats about 400 grams of carbohydrates a day. <laughs> so if you, if you drop that down to 100 grams uh, and you eliminate some of the processed food, you can show measurable changes, measurable improvement in metabolic health within 30 days. Um, but again, that, that message doesn't get out there. But when you, you know, again, when I have the opportunity one-on-one -on -one to explain this to people, uh, you know, almost everyone says, you know, okay, I, I can do that. Uh, you know, and, uh, you know, and then when I sit down to explain to them that it's going to be, have a much greater effect at protecting you from the effects of this virus than wearing a mask is. Uh, again, you know, most people are, are willing to do that. Uh, but, you know, unfortunately, we don't have widespread messaging to that effect. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> that's amazing to me that something can be changed within 30 days because I keep hearing this. Oh, well, that takes too long. We need to deal with something now. So we need to, you know, have the vaccine. We need to wear masks. We need to isolate, blah, 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 because it just is not doable to, to get your health in check in, in a, a short enough period of time to make a difference. I'm thinking yeah, unfortunately, 30 days, that's not that long. How long have we been doing this for? Exactly. We've been doing a this long for time. 10 months and <laughs> we're, we're not in great shape, honestly. You yeah. Know, on the front, you know, everything seems to be getting worse again in a lot of places, despite, you know, the wearing masks and the lockdowns and everything else that we've tried. Uh, and it, it is just, you know, ultimately it is very frustrating, uh, you know, as a physician, uh, you know, just seeing, seeing this play out uh, and really the parallels uh, to the nutritional, uh, you know, playbook, uh, you know, it, it, it's been the same kind of thing, you know, when you go back and you look at the original dietary guidelines, uh, you know, when they were released in 1980 to try and combat the pandemic of heart disease at that time, uh, you know, and they came out with these dietary guidelines. And here we are 40 years later, and the pandemic of heart disease has only gotten worse. But every five years when they update those dietary guidelines, they say, oh, the reason they haven't worked is because people aren't listening to it and it's not severe. We're enough. doing it wrong. We're doing right. it. Yeah. Even though the data clearly shows that people are following the guidelines, uh, the, mm -hmm. the consumption, you know, the amount of fat consumed, uh, you know, per capita in this country is down 40% since 1980. Uh, and then I look at the same messaging occurring, you know, around the masks and the lockdowns. And, you know, now we're going through this period where cases are going up again and everyone's saying, oh, it's because people aren't wearing their masks enough and people aren't doing the lockdowns hard enough. And yet, you know, so I travel for work. I, I fly, you know, uh, you know, every week I'm on, you know, planes back and forth, to, you know, uh, for work. And I go through the airport and everyone is wearing their mask and I go to the stores and everyone is wearing their mask. Uh, so I, again, I just, it, it's upsetting to me to see that messaging repeated that, you know, the reason that these things are failing can't be because the mess, you know, it's the wrong thing to be doing. It has to be because people aren't following, aren't it. doing it right, uh, right. Even though the evidence is, is clearly to the contrary. Yeah. I heard it was something like 90, I don't know, 5% compliance or something. It's like really high. So, yeah, I mean, like I said, you know, my experience going through airports is, you know, I would put it at 99% compliant. Wow. You, know, uh, okay. you see, it, it is very rare for me to see someone walking around without a mask, you know, if they're not sitting there eating something or, you know, uh, it's very rare to see people uh, walking around without a mask. Now we could quibble about whether they're wearing the mask right and, you know, mm. whether the types of masks that people are being told right. to wear are, are, you know, useful or not. Uh, and that might be part of the problem. Uh, I guess, you know, theoretically, if we all walked around in N95 masks all the time. <laughs> maybe it would have some effect. But again, that's just not practically, uh, you know, doable. 
Uh, and uh, like I said, I just, it, you know, it, 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 it upsets me to see that we've lost this opportunity because we've now had 10 yeah. months uh, yeah. to try it. And, and, and it's not like people haven't been saying this. You look at, uh, you know, Asim Mahaltra over in, uh, you know, the UK, yeah. uh, and he's been saying this for 10 months. Uh, and he is actually, you know, has some standing, you know, with, with the government. And, and uh, when Boris Johnson got COVID, uh, you know, Asima Halter said he needs to improve his metabolic health. And Boris Johnson came out and said, okay, we're going to get people, you know, healthier in this country. And then what did he say? Eat less and move more. <laughs> the same advice that hasn't worked <laughs> for the past 40 years. Oy, oy, goodness. So, okay, but, speaking of yeah. masks and, you know, like not wearing them correctly, those kind of things, this is the last question I'll ask you. Um, being that you are a surgeon, obviously you wear a mask. What yeah. type of mask do you wear? And, and I'm asking you this because a lot of the arguments I'm seeing is, uh, well, if it's good enough for a surgeon to wear a mask, obviously masks are important or they wouldn't wear them. So if you want your surgeon to wear a mask, why wouldn't you? So here's something very fascinating that I discovered because I was looking into all this mask issue. There is actually not any data showing that masks are beneficial for surgeons to wear during surgery. Wow. Uh -huh. There was actually a, another meta-analysis that I found from a couple of years ago that went back and looked at all the studies on whether a surgeon wearing a mask during surgery reduced uh, the risk of wound infections, which is you know, the primary reason that we wear them. And uh, the data actually shows that it's not helpful. Wow. So that's the first thing I always bring out to people. Um, do I wear a mask during surgery? Yes, of course I wear a mask during surgery. Uh, but you know, we, we don't actually have the data to show that it's helpful. During surgery, I wear a, you know, a medical quality, you know, uh, mask. Uh, it's not an N N95 mask unless I'm, you know, operating on a patient that we know has COVID, um, which fortunately is rare in my specialty. Uh, but, you know, I just wear a regular surgical mask. Um, mm -hmm. When I'm out in public, uh, I, I wear a cloth mask, you know, like everyone else. Uh, and, uh, you know, like I said, you know, it, the data again would show that N95 masks are probably better than both cloth and surgical masks. Uh, the data does not show a whole lot of difference between cloth and surgical masks. Uh, so, you know, I, I would say they're equally ineffective. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's necessary for people to be, you know, trying to go out and, and finding surgical masks. I think those should be reserved for, you know, healthcare settings. Uh, and uh, certainly the N95 masks, I think, you know, should not be worn by the general public unless, you know, it, it, for specific situations. I think if you've been diagnosed with COVID and for some reason you need to go out, uh, you should be wearing an N95 mask to protect other people. Uh, but I don't think, uh, you know, an N95 mask for people to be wearing out in public to protect them from the COVID, uh, from COVID is going to be uh, particularly useful. Yes, very interesting. You know, the, the more you learn, right? <laughs> okay, so we are almost out, of, well, uh, we are out of time. Is there any advice or anything you want to say to? Like I said, my number one message is, you know, focus on your metabolic health, improve your metabolic health. Uh, and the, the, the best way to do that is through diet. Uh, and then, you know, the other lifestyle uh, issues, sleep and, and exercise and sunlight all play a part in that. But, uh, you know, it, if you're only going to focus on one thing, focus on your diet with the goal of improving your metabolic health, not with the goal of, you know, weight loss, not even with the goal of preventing some disease. Those will all happen, but you should just be focused on improving your metabolic health. And that, that's the messaging that I think people need to understand. And then the other message I just tell people is, you know, 
demand to be healthy. Uh, don't accept that you can't that you can't be healthy. Uh, if you're seeing a physician for a medical problem and they are telling you there's no answer, uh, keep asking questions and, and find you know find other physicians. Uh, you know it, it may be you know unfortunately sometimes people uh, don't discover their problems or don't address their problems until it's too late. Uh, but you know ultimately we shouldn't accept that we can't be healthy. Uh, you know, the, these chronic medical problems, uh, I think a large portion of them are reversible, uh, even though, you know, the messaging is it, they're usually not. And you're even told even by medical professionals, you will always be on insulin as a type two. Yeah. Uh, you, you, this chronic, your autoimmune issue, you can't reverse. Well, we see this all the time, that that is not true that there is something you can do and you are not necessarily, you know, always going to have to have that condition. I mean, there's always exceptions, but for the most part, what we see on a daily basis, you very much can reverse most everything, the chronic yeah. disease type of, you know, things anyway. I mean, type one diabetes, that's a different animal, those kind of things, of course, but. Take back your health. Exactly. That's Great what I message. Tell everyone. Yes. And I, I, I do think it's so important for you to take responsibility for yourself. And, you know, like you said, question the doctors. Um, I, I probably question way too much, but, you know, if you don't ask, you don't know. And who knows? <laughs> it could be something that actually saves your life. So always ask, don't be afraid. Well, Phil, it's exactly. been a blast having you on. Thank you so much. And I think Thank you have you. a lot of valuable information that uh, a lot of people will get a lot of benefit from. And uh, hey, y'all, while you're here, subscribe and then go follow Phil. I'll put his information below. Go check out his, uh, what, what you call it, telehealth? Tele uh, yep. So I have a telemedicine practice. It's open to uh, patients across the country. Uh, you can find that o at ovadiaheartthealth.com. And uh, you can follow me on uh, Twitter at uh, ifixhearts. Awesome. I'll have it below. So no worries. Again, Phil, thank you so much. I'm so glad that you came on. Thank you, Amber. Thank you for having me. This has been a lot of fun, and uh, I hope this has been uh, useful to your audience. And uh, sure, it will. Uh, maybe we can do it again sometime. Absolutely. Bye, Phil. All right. Bye.